Hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Christy Amobi, and I work with the product division within Extral, and I will be the moderator for today's session. Uh, joining us today is Dr. Richard Schaefer. He will present on a range of clinical conditions that can be treated with superficial and orthovoltage radiotherapy machines. Uh, the presentation is uh, introductory. It will focus on the treatment of non-melanoma skin cancer, including several case, uh, uh, illustrative cases. It will also provide information on palliative indications and benign indications, including the treatment of benign musculoskeletal and skin conditions. Dr. Schaefer is a clinical oncologist with Genesis Care and medical director at Extra. The presentation is approximately 20 minutes with plenty of time for questions and answers at the end. Again, thank you so much for your attention. And with that, I'll hand it over to Dr. Schaefer. Thank you, Christy. And thank you for the opportunity to present today. Um, my talk's gonna be about superficial and orthovoltage systems for the treatment of non-melanoma skin cancer and benign conditions. So in summary, I'm mainly going to talk about non-melanoma skin cancer, so basal cell carcinoma and cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma. I'll also talk about the treatment of palliative conditions, and then I'll talk about the treatment of benign conditions, both musculoskeletal conditions and benign skin conditions. So non-melanoma skin cancer um, is the mo most common cancer worldwide. In fact, in 2016, the Global Burden of Disease Study estimated 1.5 million cases of non-melanoma skin cancer. It's also increasing in incidence. So squamous cell carcinoma has risen by up to 10%, and basal cell carcinoma has risen by up to 80% in the last 30 years in the US. It's also routinely underestimated, as most uh, registries don't routinely collect non-melanoma cases. Although they have low mortality generally, there is a high morbidity. So particularly after surgery, there can be dysfunction, disfigurement, and psychological burden, particularly in the head and neck region. There's little current data about cost per patient, but in 2008, there was a paper estimating the total cost per patient in the UK of £1,226. So what are the treatment options? Well, surgery uh, is often thought of as a standard option. So standard excision or Mohs surgery, radiotherapy, of course, we're going to talk about that in more detail, curatage and electro desiccation, photodynamic therapy, and various topical treatments. But the decisions tend to depend on the clini clinician preference and expertise, and radiotherapy is therefore often not considered or reserved for most advanced cancers or just for frail patients. So what are the indications for radiotherapy? Well, particularly where surgery is either not possible or where it's refused. If there are high risk features after surgery, so for instance, a depth of more than four to six millimeters, a margin which is either positive or close, generally thought to be within a millimeter, diameter more than two centimeters, poor differentiation and perineural invasion, either of a nerve uh, more than 0.1 millimeters or particularly of a named nerve with, with symptoms. Other indications would include patient choice and particularly in cosmetically sensitive regions such as the around the eye, the lips, the nose and the ears. There are various types of radiotherapy. Going for the bottom, um, brachytherapy is uh, short-range radiotherapy delivered via wires or seeds. External beam radiotherapy can be delivered in various ways. Um, often megavoltage x-rays are used to treat uh, complex targets deep within the body. They tend not to be used so much for skin cancer. Electrons and kilovoltage x-rays are used for superficial lesions, particularly when they're small. So this is a typical mixed model um, and a place that I worked until fairly recently, the Royal Surrey County Hospital in the UK. And in fact, 73% of UK centres have at least one kilovoltage radiotherapy machine. The catchment of the Royal Surrey is 1.3 million uh, population. 
and there were 3,000 new patients per year with more than 300 receiving radiotherapy for skin cancer. The centre had eight linear accelerators and provided such services as VMAT, electrons, stereotactic radiosurgery and SABRE, and they treated 350 patients per day. There was also an XTRAL machine which delivered three energies, 80 kV, 140 kV and 250 kV. Um, and this machine treated 80% of the skin cancers, about 250 patients per year, benign conditions such as Dupuytren's disease and keloids, and also palliative conditions, for instance, rib metastases and gynecomastia. There was also a brachytherapy service that was used mainly for prostate and gynecological indications. So what are the advantages of kilovoltage x-rays? Well, it's quick, so you can do the markup and the first fraction in a single visit. It's simple and generally no shell or immobilization device is needed, no bolus is needed, which you would need for electrons, and in most cases you can use the standard lead cutout. It's also very versatile um, with a small treatment margin due to a low penumbra, um, and you can treat uh, eyelid, uh, eyelid lesions uh, by using internal eye shields. It's very comfortable, and this is important particularly for old and frail patients. You can use it on a soft couch with pillows, and you can even treat the patient in a wheelchair or on a bed. It's also cheap in terms of the machine purchase cost and consumables. So let's look at some cases of non-melanoma skin cancer treated with kilovoltage x-rays. This first one was an 82-year-old lady. She was treated with 37.5 gray in five fractions over one week using 100 kilovoltage uh, photons. And you can see that there was a simple lead cutout uh, there was a previously used cutout to define the, uh, the field size, which is around two, two and a half centimetres, and there was lead shielding in the nostril to, uh, to protect the inside of the nose. This case was a 69-year-old lady with a squamous cell carcinoma on the side of the nose, which you can see here. She had diabetes, she had rheumatoid arthritis and, and was on immunosuppression and also on antiplatelet therapy and therefore surgery was felt not to be the best treatment for this lady. She had however had multiple previous surgeries on her face and scalp and didn't want to have further surgery. This one's after the biopsy and she was treated with 52.5 gray and 15 fractions over five weeks, five treatments a week, with 80 kilovoltage photons and an appropriate margin around the tumour. You can see on the final fraction, there was some radiation dermatitis, some scabbing, which was drying up two weeks after the treatment, but already by a month after the treatment, the skin is looking really very intact. This is a gentleman who was 83 years old, and he had an excision and a graft, which was margin positive with, uh, with a squamous cell carcinoma. You can see the graft here is the red dots. Um, and this is the patient two months after the graft so that we could allow healing. The patient was treated to a field of the blue dots with 40 gray and 10 fractions over two weeks using 100 kilovoltage photons with a 3.5 times 3 centimeter ellipse. And you can see this red lead shield over the right eye as well. Very simple treatment. This is a gentleman, 75 years old, who had two basal cell carcinomas one on the forehead and one on the temple. The left temple was treated with 40, with 40 gray and 10 fractions over two weeks using 120 uh, kV photons with a customized lead cutout. And the forehead lesion was treated with 35 gray and five fractions over one week as it was a smaller lesion with 100 kV photons. And you can see that there was complete resolution of the lesion both on the forehead and also the temple at a year after radiotherapy. This is an elderly man with a large scalp squamous cell carcinoma. This was treated with um, a predefined leg cutout um, with 45 grain and 10 fractions. And the leg cutout was used to define the field size and the app applicator was applied in contact with the cutout. These are a couple of pictures of basal cell carcinomas. Uh, first of all, on the lower eyelid over here, and second of all, on the medial canthus, these are very treatable with kilovoltage photons with uh, the insertional, uh, insertion of an internal eye shield. And also this patient had a lead mask used as well. 
This gentleman has an ear uh, lesion treated with uh, the ear tapes. And this gentleman had a, a squamous cell carcinoma on the lower, li uh, lower lip. And this was six months after the end of radiotherapy. Coming on to palliative indications. Kinovogic photons are very easy treatment for superficial bone metastases, particularly of the ribs, skin metastases, gynecomastia after, after hormone treatment, particularly for prostate cancer, and also mesothelioma drain sites. I'll show you a couple of these cases now. This was a 65-year-old lady with carcinoma of the splenic flexure with a rib metastasis that was giving her pain. She was treated with 20 gray in five fractures over one week using 300 kilovoltage photons, and this gave her good pain relief. This was a 66-year-old man with mes mesothelioma who had a chest drain inserted in a fusion drain and a CT-guided biopsy. And in order to prevent a local recurrence of those areas, he was treated with uh, both to the biopsy and the chest drain sites with 20 grain, five fractures over one week, both with 260 kilovoltage photons. We can also use radiotherapy for benign conditions. And there are two main mechanisms. One is anti-proliferative, and the other one is an anti-inflammatory mechanism. We can treat musculoskeletal conditions, which I've put in two categories. First of all, hyperproliferative, including Dupuytren's disease, plantar fibromatosis, and keloid scarring. And generally, the dose can be around 30 gray, or up to 30 gray. With inflammatory conditions, such as plantar fasciitis, osteoarthritis, and epicondylitis, the dose tends to be much lower at three to six gray. We can also treat benign skin conditions, so chronic resistant dermatoses, such as psoriasis, eczema, and disseminated superficial actinic porokeratosis. Coming on to Dupuytren's contracture. This is a common benign condition of the palmar fascia and starts as nodules, cords, and skin retraction. It can progress to contracture, which is fixed bending of the fingers. And you can see in the diagram below, that here's a nodule. There's an early cord here already starting to pull the finger down. And then this is a very established contracture. Radiotherapy, however, is used in the early phases where there are nodules and cords, or and or cords, with either no contracture or a very minor contracture of up to 10 degrees. And also it has to be progressive in the last six to 12 months. This is how we do it. So you can see that I've marked on this gentleman the cords, the nodules, and the field. And this is him getting his hand treated with an appropriate lead shield. We tend to use 100 to 150 kV photons in two phases. The first phase is 15 grain, five fractions over one week. There's then approximately a three month gap, and then a further 15 grain, five fractions over one week. You can see the results from a study by Siegenschmidt et al, where they treated uh, patients with uh, a total of 718 hands with a median follow-up of eight and a half years. It was a non-randomized control group, but all the same, these are the results. You can see that regarding progression, radiotherapy reduces the chance of progression from 62% with no radiotherapy to 20% with radiotherapy. And it reduces the chance of needing surgery for a contracture from 30% to 8% with radiotherapy. There are more details to be found on the website, thedupertronspractice.com. We can also treat plantar fasciitis, which is the most common cause of heel pain and affects 10% of the population. 80% of these resolve with conservative measures such as resting, stretching, icing, and changing footwear. However, for resistant plantar fasciitis, where the patients had it for at least six months, there are two randomized controlled trials showing that radiotherapy is better than both sham radiotherapy or steroid injections. This is how we do it. We use higher energy photons than for Dupuytren's disease with 150 to 300 kV photons, using three to six gray in six fractions over two to three weeks, with 0.5 to one gray per fraction, giving two to three fractions per week. And it gives an 80% partial or complete response rate with minimal side effects. And again, there's more information on the on healpainpractice.com. We can also treat keloids with radiotherapy, 
This is done mainly postoperatively within 24 to 48 hours after surgery. And killer voltage photons are particularly suited to starting this quickly, where time is obviously quite critical. You can see in this uh, picture that there was a keloid scar of this uh, patient's ear. It was then excised and treated with radiotherapy soon afterwards. And then this is uh, the long term outcome. We tend to use 80 to 150 kilovoltage photons, depending on the depth. We use variable doses and fractionations. Um, different centers tend to have their own uh, doses and fractionations. However, I tend to use a risk adaptive approach, um, according to Ogawa in 2019, where low risk uh, sites such as the earlobe, I use one fraction of eight gray. Intermediate sites, for, in for instance, the oracle of the year, I, I would use 15 gray in two fractions, and high risk sites, for instance, the anterior chest, I would use 18 gray in three fractions. We can also use kilo voltage x rays to treat skin conditions, particularly superficial skin conditions such as psoriasis, eczema, and DSAC. If these are very superficial, then we would use Grenz rays at 10 to 12 kilo voltage. If, however, they're thicker, particularly in the hands and the, in the hands and feet, nails and scalp, we might choose to use more uh, higher energy X-rays at 20 to 50 kV. So in summary, the advantages of superficial orthovoltage radiotherapy would include that it's simple, it's quick, it's cheap, and it's comfortable. It often tends to be used within a multimodality department, although not exclusively, and it's clinically very versatile. We can treat non-melanoma skin cancer, palliative indications, musculoskeletal indications, and benign skin disease. So thank you for your attention. I'll, I'll, I'll hand back to you for questions. Um, let me see, there, there, there are a few questions coming in. Okay, our first question, um, how much variability do you see in fractionation? And are you, are you finding that um, people are, are using very large doses for any of these conditions? So, um, in terms of fractionation, I guess the main one to talk about would be non-melanoma skin cancer. And fractionation depends on a few things. First of all, um, people sometimes differentiate between the fraction uh, between the dose for basal cell carcinomas and squamous cell carcinomas. Others don't really differentiate. But the main issues are how large the lesion is. And the smaller the lesion is, the fewer fractions you can use. The larger the lesions is, the more you'd want to fractionate. Um, the other thing is, it depends on what the patient's like as well. So if you have a very frail patient, you might want to tend towards using fewer fractions. Whereas if you get a very young fit patient for whom partic particularly where cosmesis is very important, you might want to use um, a larger number of fractions. So that's uh, non-melanoma skin cancer in a nutshell. Um, but I will say there is a lot of variability um, in terms of the doses and the fractionations that people use. Um, sure. In, in, okay, in, in terms of <laughs> other benign conditions, um, Duprichon's disease uh, tends to be a fairly um, standard fractionation. So 15 gray and five fractions, three months gap, 15 gray and five fractions. There's an alternative of 21 gray and seven fractions given on alternate weekdays. Um, it tends to perform not as well, but it does have logistical advantages. And the last one I'll talk about is, is plantar fasciitis, where um, we're using an anti-inflammatory dose, and it used to, used to use six gray and six fractions, but in fact, there are studies showing that we can now use three gray and six fractions and give the same uh, effect. So um, a really good question, quite a complicated answer, I'm afraid. Sure, sure. Um, okay, uh, a few more questions coming in. And the next question, in what cases would you recommend using superficial radiation therapy over um, electrons and VMAT? Okay, so in terms of the choice between different techniques, that tends to depend mainly on the configuration of the lesion and the site of the lesion. So, um, for instance, uh, for VMAT, I would only really tend to use that for more complicated, deeper, complex 3D shapes. Um, so where there's deep invasion 
or where there's lesions that go over very complicated curved surfaces, for instance, whole scalp or um, and, and so on. Um, most of what I would treat, I would use the superficial machine. I mean, I just find it's by far the easiest machine, the most comfortable and the quickest um, and logistically just the best machine from my point of view for most patients. However, there are some patients that I would use um, electrons for. Um, that particularly would be large lesions over bone, um, where really because with kilovoltage photons, you get more bone uh, absorption of the x-rays, um, it would be better to use electrons. Um, just coming back to kilovoltage, um, particularly I would tend to use it for very small lesions because for electrons you have a minimum field size generally around four centimeters, whereas we don't have that constraint for KV. And also um, I, I like using it around the eye because you can put internal eye shields very easily um, to, to, to shield things off. So different, uh, different lesions really for, for different modalities, but as I say, in my presentation, 80% of the skin cancers that I treat when I have all available, I would tend to treat with KV. Okay, all right. Next question. Do you have a rule of thumb for what energy to use on non-melanoma skin cancer based on width and depth? I'm sorry, Christy, you, um, you cut out. <laughs> Oh, no, apologies. Let me let me ask you again. Uh, do you have a rule of thumb on for what energy to use for non-melanoma skin cancer based on width and depth? So, um, really, the energy that we use has to be selected according to the depth of the lesion. And there are a few basic ways of, of trying to find out what the depth of the lesion is. Um, one often that we use is just a clinical um, is, is a clinical ascertainment of the depth. So you can just see if something really hasn't got any great depth at all, if it's just very flat. Um, if it has got depth, then generally um, we would use biopsy information. And we do understand that biopsies only take a small part of the lesion and therefore might not be 100% accurate. Um, sometimes, very rarely, um, people get high-frequency ultrasound readings of how um, how deep the lesion is. That gives us an idea of depth, and then we would then use the depth dose charts in order to, to pick the energy that we use to cover that depth. So really, it, it just depends on how deep the lesion is, what depth I would recommend. Okay, next question. Uh, from your point of view, is there any advantage in using HDR brachytherapy for non-melanoma skin cancer or any situation where you feel like brachytherapy can be better? So I think that's a really good question. I haven't really gone into brachytherapy, um, partly because it's not my expertise. Um, but what I would say is that um, brachytherapy can be really helpful where you've got large complex lesions on curved surfaces. So similarly to what I was talking about with VMAT, um, it can be very helpful in, in certain situations for those complex lesions. Um, and also when you're particularly worried about dose at depth, because of course brachytherapy has a very tight dose distribution. Um, however, I would say again, that even if you have brachytherapy, um, for most people with a mixed offering, it would tend to be more the exceptional patient to use it for because it, it tends to use up much more resource um, in terms of uh, staff time and so on. So, you know, there are definitely lesions that lend themselves better to brachytherapy, but, um, you know, for me, there would be the exception. Okay, um, next question. We've got quite a few coming in now. <laughs> What's the recurrence rate for the keloids? So um, that's a really good question. And um, the, the answer is, it depends how you do them. Um, there are two things that are important. Number one is surgical technique is terribly important. And, and, and really things like, um, you know, making sure that you have non-tension scars and the particular technique, techniques that you use, particularly important to do an extra lesional excision. So in other words, take away the whole keloid rather than leave any behind. So obviously the surgical technique is, is very important. The next thing is the radiotherapy, and there are two aspects. One is technique. Of course, you need to um, treat to depth, although normally we would tend to use uh, 80 kilovoltage photons would be absolutely fine. 
um, depending on the site. If, for instance, if you're treating an earlobe you might, and it's on both sides, you might want to go a little deeper, so therefore higher energy. The last thing is, um, depending on the site, as I was saying, depends on the dose that we, you would use. So what's behind that is the earlobe keloids tend not to come back in many cases. And therefore, although you do need to give some sort of adjuvant treatment, of which radiotherapy is the best, you don't need to give a terribly high dose. Whereas for places like the anterior chest, for instance, there's a very high recurrence rate, and therefore you do need to give a higher dose. So this is the sort of risk-adapted approach. Um, if you use all of those things, and I would refer you to the Ogawa paper to look for all those details, then I would expect a less than 10% recurrence rate at two years. Um, so that's overall. Okay. Uh, this next question is quite long, so I'm going to do my best to, to get, it, get it out here. <laughs> All right, here we go. For lesions which overlie the bone, um, e.g. the forehead and scalp, what is the risk of osteoradionecrosis of the bone when using KV? In our department, we tend to treat with electrons in these regions due to the risk, but then there are limitations by the minimal field size being four centimeters due to the electron penumbra. Yes, I, I, it's a really good question. Um, and uh, I, I, I'm afraid I don't have a specific figure for osteoradionecrosis. What I do know is that we do exactly the same. We try and avoid using KV, um, generally over the forehead and the scalp, but with one proviso, I will treat small lesions with KV. So, um, you know, that really gets around that problem. If you've got a lesion of up to two centimetres, then really we consider it in our experience that um, the uh, risk of osteoradionecrosis uh, with KV is very, very low. So anything bigger, I agree, I would use electrons. Anything smaller than a couple of centimetres, I, I just feel it's fine with KV. Okay, next question. Uh, just first a comment that it, it seems like superficial and orthovoltage radiotherapy is, is clearly beneficial for cosmetic reasons and for older patients. Under which condition can this be beneficial to young patients where cosmetic concern is not a major issue, um, such as uh, radiation therapy for other parts of the body other than the face? Yes, well, um... I mean, you know, I think it's a really good question. Um, I mean, that acknowledges the fact that, you know, obviously cosmesis is really important on the face. Um, I think for most people, it's the most important cosmetic area. Um, I think I would really point people towards more of a sort of efficiency gain. So, um, you know, as I said in my presentation, you know, it, it's just much easier to get someone on treatment. You know, I would see a patient, I could uh, take a history, consent them for the radiotherapy, mark up the area, and they would have had their first fraction on the same day. Um, and for most departments, um, that, you know, particularly for um, a complex lesion, that wouldn't be possible for using electrons, and certainly not with uh, megavoltage photons. So I think, you know, in terms of efficiency, and, and, and along with that, of course, if you're using less staff time, that also means, uh, you know, less financial resource. Uh, so that's really what I would point towards outside of the head and neck region. Okay. Um, just a reminder to everyone who's attending this session, if you'd like to ask any questions, you can use the question section of the GoToWebinar control panel. We have a couple more coming in. Um, next question. When, how, and how often do you need customized cutouts? So um, it really depends where you are in your journey. Um, if you've got a well-established service and you've been doing it for many years, then you know you would have created all sorts of cutouts in all sorts of sizes and shapes. And so in a well-established service, you know we, we would tend to have a lot of cutouts that center around the sort of two to five centimeter sort of range which cover most uh, lesions. So, you know, for instance, I remember we had lots of circles, you know, a two centimeter circle, a 2.2 centimeter circle and 2.3 centimeter, just so we can pick exactly what we need. And we also had ellipses um, and uh, rectangular uh, cutouts as well. But of course, when you start, um, apart from having a few standard ones, um, they're all going to feel a little unique. Um, and so often you will have to cut um, your shielding material, which generally tends to be lead, 
um, and that can be just done on site with the appropriate uh, safeguards. Um, so it really, as I say, if you've got lots of cutouts, then you're not going to have to do very much customising. If you don't have many, then of course you will have to do a lot. The last thing I'll say is that you know the other way of doing it is by using lead strips. And that means that you can really define any lesion using lead strips that you tape. Um, it's not as elegant a solution, but it, it can mean that you don't have to customise your cutouts for that reason. Okay, um, next question. Uh, please explain the possible field sizes. I'm not sure if this is in reference to a particular indication. It just says if you could explain more about the possible field sizes. I'm not sure I understand the question, I'm afraid. Okay, all right. Um, for for that person, if you want to ask us to, if you want to clarify it for something specific, just let us know, or we can, we can also follow up with you after the event. Um, next question is just your general observations. Um, why do you think that radiotherapy is underutilized um, for, for benign conditions and, and to some extent for also for skin cancer? I think that's a great question. Um, and maybe I'll talk about the conditions in turn. So the first one, non-melanoma skin cancer. I think, you know, as I said, if you don't present the option of radiotherapy, then the patient's never going to pick it. And I think that very often there's a dogma that the patient's seen by a dermatologist and the dermatologist just cuts it out. I think for a lot of lesions, that's very reasonable. Um, you know, it's a one-stop thing, particularly on non-cosmetically sensitive regions. Um, or of course they would send it to a surgeon to cut out. So there seems to be an established pathway of surgery and very often, I think the opportunity is missed to get a radiotherapy opinion, which would sometimes, in a, a certain percentage of, of patients, they would pick radiotherapy. So I think, as I say, that that often needs that that, that option needs to be offered. I think one really good way of doing that is in, in uh, an MDT, a multidisciplinary meeting, where all the options are automatically um, offered and discussed. Um, so I think that's probably the main issue. Um, I will also say that there's very little evidence to show a difference of effectiveness of surgery and radiotherapy. Um, and so I think sometimes surgeons feel that um, that's the reason why they offer uh, surgery. Uh, I think that's uh, not a good argument for surgery. Okay. Talking about um, benign conditions, I think, um, again, I think this is really an educational piece to some extent. So, for instance, if we take Dupuytren's disease, as I showed, uh, radiotherapy can be very effective in early Dupuytren's disease to prevent it uh, progressing and forming a contracture. Um, and I think that a lot of hand surgeons just don't know about it. Um, in particular, they're used to offering various types of release surgery, and their advice tends to be just wait till it uh, till you get a contracture and we can help you. Um, I think if they don't know that the option of radiotherapy exists, then of course they won't offer it. So I think there's different uh, issues for, for different diseases. Okay, thank you. That actually was our final question. Um, so uh, with that, I just want to thank everyone for your attention again. Thank you for joining us today. And of course, thank you to you, Dr. Schaefer, for this informative presentation. On behalf of Extra, thank you for joining and have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much. <laughs>